Chapter 19, East Asia and Global Perspective. This is part two, and we're looking at the years between 1500 and 1750. And the next uh, section in our textbook is Tokugawa Japan and Choson Korea to 1800. How did Japan respond to unification, domestic peace, and Korea to the ravages of the Imjin Wars? So we talked about unification and the Imjin War um, in part one. Uh, so I mentioned this was a disastrous war for Korea and a, and a failure for Japan. But Japan flourished afterward and had an era of economic growth. But like I said in part one, Korea not so fortunate. They were, they were left with rebuilding and reconstructing. Their country was in complete ruins. But for Japan, this is the era of the Tokugawa shogunate, which would be the last of Japan's three shogunates. So what were Japan's three shogunates? The Kamakura, the Ashikaga, and the Tokugawa. Let's start part two here with a short film regarding the history of the shogunates. Uh, this will look at the first two also. So before our period, but again, adding context to the Tokugawa shogunate by looking at all three, uh, and also Japan <coughs> culture and society um, throughout the years. Please watch the film entitled The Shogunate History of Japan, and then come on back. Okay, so we remember I Ieyasu, and he establishes the Tokugawa shogunate. After all the war and death and the suicide of Hideyori, after all that instability, things actually settled down in Japan, and they experienced an economic renaissance. And trade from their commercial center at Kyoto, uh, later renamed Edo, uh, today the city of Tokyo, uh, that becomes a commercial center, and their trade led to a resurgence in their economy. And times were good. Unless, of course, you were a peasant, and time, times are never good for peasants. Let's go to our next film. Uh, please watch the film entitled Life in Edo, Japan, 1603-1868, uh, and then come on back. Okay, so after only two years in power, Ieyasu uh, abdicated the throne to his son, Tokugawa uh, Hedetada. Uh, Ieyasu maintained control until his death 11 years later, but, but this maneuver established the hereditary nature of the shogunate passed down by the father's bloodline, uh, which it would be maintained through 15 Tokugawa shoguns until 1867, so a long time, long period. Uh, the Tokugawa shogunate was by, by and large a peaceful period. Uh, 250 years or so. So again, that's longer than the United States has been a country. So think about, give you perspective. Uh, so not exactly easy to have a period of peace for 250 years. Uh, the, the intrigues of the Tokugawa clan down through the centuries uh, were, 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 were very much the match of the European dynasty to the same era in their betrayals and violence. Uh, for for most Japanese, you, you lived in one of the four classes. So this is very similar to European feudalism. It's a fe it's feudalism in in, in Japan. Uh, so the so the four classes: the shoguns, nobility, daimyo. Of course, they rule the samurai, the farmers, the artisans, the merchants. Uh, not so not so much. So life under the rigid hierarchy of the shogun it was hardly carefree. So very much like the European pyramid we saw in a, a, a class or two back, <clears throat> the emperor's at the top, and and he he had he was at the top, but had little power. And we we learned this: the shogun, right below, is the actual ruler of Japan, and then below them are the daimyo, the wealthy landowners. Uh, below them, the samurai, Japan's warriors. <clears throat> the largest class is the is the peasants artisans and merchants um, you know they're they're the workers they're they're the ones that are working hard to create wealth for the for the emperor the shogun the, the country but get nothing in, in real in return they, they live in poverty and this is the way it is worldwide in, anywhere that you that you look at the, the the lower working class was always treated this way uh, they are the lowest class because they produce nothing on their own. They're producing for others. Okay, so this is the this is the hierarchy of of Japan from the emperor, shogun, daimyo, samurai, farmers, artisans, peasants. From the top to the bottom, 
where are most of the people at the bottom where's most of the wealth at the top inequality of wealth again uh okay so but but the era was was marked by stability but that stability came at a cost uh, to make the situation worse, the, the nobility paid no taxes, uh, making economic recovery that much more difficult, okay? Okay, let's do a supplemental lecture right here. This is number four, and we'll call this Sokoku, okay? Let's go to our outline. Number one, introduction, COVID-19. How does that relate to 17th century Japan? Number two, isolation. So that's what Sokoku is about. Is, is, so we're going back to this, this idea of isolation in, in Japan. Sokoku, what part did the shogun play in Sokoku? How did Sokoku affect Christians? And what were the strict laws involved with that? Uh, the, the, the Jima, what is that? And what part did the Dutch play? What is the uh, uh, Rengaku? And then modernization, talking about the, the Meiji Restoration and the Edo period. And then, of course, as always, at the end, we'll talk about the relevance, okay? Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so in our very recent history, because of the fear of the spread of the coronavirus, uh, much of the global population was in lockdown. And we learned about social distancing, staying away from each other, staying six feet apart and standing in line six feet apart when you're at the market or wherever you might be. Uh, and this is, of course, all, all new for us since, like, this has never happened before. But, in fact, it has. The, the last time the world saw an isolation of this scale, it was very different in nature. So, welcome to 17th century Japan, where 30 million people, a lot of people, entered a 220-year period known as Sokoku, uh, which means isolation. J Japanese were forbidden to leave and bring back new ideas. Uh, they developed into a self-sufficient country. Europeans were met with resistance to open the East to trade. Expansion to the West was more profitable for the Americas, so many Europeans just went there instead, mm -hmm. which resulted in more wealth for them and perhaps the Americas, and it was probably a little bit of a, of a missed opportunity for Japan, but they wanted to stay isolated, okay? Um, this is why they, they chose to do that. So the Shogun... Uh, they isolate Japan. They don't want any foreign influence in Japan. They force all foreigners to leave. They took a firm grip on the country, and they believed that Christianity and other foreign influences were a threat to the newfound stability of the country. So Christians were, were, were persecuted as threats in the Sokoku era. Social mobility was impossible, uh, such, and an isolation known as Sokoku meant that Japanese culture, the Japanese culture, was a closed system. So Sokoku means a chained or locked country. So according to your book, it was a policy of seclusion and meant that most Japanese couldn't leave and most foreigners couldn't enter Japan without the approval of the authorities and if violated, they would face the threat of execution. Uh, so the laws enforcing Sokoku were strict. Leaving the country was punishable by death should one return. So if you, if you left Japan, you probably don't want to go back because it might cost you your life. Even receiving a letter from abroad could get an entire family killed. Uh, so let's watch our next film. Watch the film entitled Sokoku uh, History. Now this film has no narration, so you have to read along with it. But, but please stay with it as it has good information regarding Sokoku. And the music in the background is different and unusual also. So uh, enjoy the music and just read along and kind of get some background what we're talking about here. So go ahead and watch that film and then come back. Okay, but, but foreign powers, while, while Japan's trying to isolate in, in this era of Sokoku, foreign powers were offering temptations to them. You know, Western science, you know, warfare, new ways of warfare, just the wonders of the world. Uh, this, this resulted in Japan not being as closed as closed would suggest. Uh, in 1634, just off the coast of the southern port of Nagasaki, a trading post called Dejima was created for foreign traders. 
So this is interesting. This is a man-made island. So if you look at the image here, uh, at the bottom, uh, this is the landmass of Japan, the, the, the city of Nagasaki right here. But they built this island, man-made island, out you know, in the harbor with this bridge. Okay, So, so what is this all about? Um, this, first it was Portuguese, then it was later a Dutch trading post at Nagasaki, Japan. And this was there for 220 years, 1634 to 1854. And just a sidebar, of course, Nagasaki is where the the uh, the World War II came to an end. Hiroshima first. Nagasaki got the second atomic bomb that ended the uh, World War II when the United States dropped two atomic bombs on on the two cities in Japan for the first time in history and the last time so far anyway. Uh, so back to uh, back to Dejima. This was the only place designated for foreign trade and exchange during this isolationist period. So Dejima was a fan a small fan shaped artificial island in the bay in the bay sorry about that in the bay of Nagasaki. Uh, so again I pointed out on the map the, the, the bottom the bottom here is Nagasaki and the bridge goes over to the island itself. This was the only place that they would allow foreign traders to come and trade. They wouldn't let them on the soil of their land. They had to stay out in this little island. Uh, so the Portuguese, um, they're, they're the ones that brought Christianity to, to Japan, along with firearms and African slavery. And you see here, the, they, 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 were, they were brutal people in, the, in that era anyway. Uh, uh, okay, so the Portuguese were one of the first Europeans to trade African slaves. So Japan knew this and knew what, what their reputation was and, and they weren't happy about these types of influences. Uh, so favor turned towards the Dutch who brought nothing but goods to trade, not slaves and not violence, they brought goods. They had also shown their commitment to the Shogun and helped to actually at one point helped to quell an uprising. So along with the Chinese, the Dutch were the only ships allowed into Dejima and Japan from 1641 onwards. Uh, only a small number of Japanese even had access to Dejima. Again, the only place in, in Japan open to the world to trade goods, but also foreign ideas. That's what Japan's trying to keep away from their people. We don't, we don't mind having your goods, but we don't want you or your foreign ideas to, to you know, um, uh, pollute our our people and get them to think like you. Uh, so Dejima, this man-made island, remained the only place in Japan open to the Western world. So while they were on this island, this tiny island, and in between ships, the Dutch kept themselves amused. Uh, they introduced Japan to the likes of billiards and badminton. Uh, beer was brewed. And, and products like cabbage, tomatoes, and chocolate appeared for the first time that they'd never seen before. So, so all this Sokoku was implemented to keep foreign influence out of Japan, especially Western influence. It, it didn't quite work out that way. You know, foreigners didn't always stay on the island either. Uh, in, in true Shogun style, the Dutch were expected to make the annual 1,200 kilometer trek from Dejima to pay their respects at the capital Edo to the Shogun. And they took exotic exotic gifts, introducing treasures from around the world, as well as the likes of globes and telescopes and medical teachings, spectacles, eyeglasses, and more. Uh, you know, further increasing Japanese exposure to foreign goods and ideas. Uh, so the Dutch audience with the Shogun was an honor. And while in Edo, they were housed in buildings because they stayed there. So the Dutch truly had much influence on Japan compared to other Western countries. Uh, uh, the, the eighth shogun was Tokugawa Yashimume. And, and he took more of a liberal approach to Sokoku in the early 18th century and encouraged what was called Rengaku. Okay, so what is Rengaku? 
It is a body of knowledge developed by Japan through its contacts with the Dutch enclave of Dejima, which allowed Japan to keep abreast of Western technology and medicine in the period when the country was closed to foreigners. So you're talking about even though we're closed, we're still kind of keeping, you know, abreast with what's going on in the West. So Reng Rengoku, Rengaku, sorry, is Dutch learning and the wider study of Western medicine as well as science, military studies, astronomy, and more. It's Dutch influence. Rengaku movement argued that the dissemination of Western ideas and knowledge would actually strengthen Japan, not weaken it. You know, don't be afraid. Let, let, let us share what we have with you. It'll, it'll, it'll make you stronger. Uh, so this uh, Rengaku movement you know, ultimately led to the removal of the Sokoku policy and the opening up of Japan. <clears throat> uh, but the policy of Sokoku <clears throat> effectively came to a halt as, as uh, Commodore Perry's ships from the United States representing the might of the United States, sailed the Yokohama Bay in 1853 <clears throat> and, and demanded that Japan open trade to the West. So the United States forced Japan by the threat of military might and, and gun power to open their trade and open their, their doors to trade and the Sokoku era was, was essentially over. So we talked about this Edo period. Um, uh, I'm sorry, this, this, uh, I, I skipped the slide, the, the, the modern period. So this is the modern era of Japan. This, this marked a new era and the beginning of modernization of Japan, also called the Meiji Restoration. Uh, okay, now to the Edo period. So the Edo period, um, when was this, what was this period in, in the history of Japan? Uh, it was when Japan was under the rule of the Tokugawa shogunate considered to be one of the most exciting periods. Probably one of the most Japanese periods uh, in terms of its culture with its images of samurai and the shogun. Uh, and, and, and that's perhaps a little insulting to say it like that. Uh, I wasn't too happy to hear, hear that comment made, but I decided to share it anyway to, just to say how easy it is to say things that are insulting. I mean, what does most Japanese period really mean? Okay. But the, what it means is the culture and the, and the icons and the images that come to people's mind that aren't Japanese is what this, what this era um, represents, okay? Okay, so to, to, to wrap it up, the, the, the Dutch, even though the Japanese were isolated, the Dutch had a major influence over this, this supposedly secluded nation, although not quite as isolated as you might think. Okay, the relevance of this lecture to wrap this up, the relevance is this period of seclusion known as Sokoku had lent itself positively to Japan and the unique culture that has evolved into what we know today. One more time, the period of seclusion known as Sokoku has lent itself positively to Japan and the unique culture that has evolved into what we know today. And that is the end of supplemental lecture number four, Sokoku, okay? So moving on. All right, the shogunate was unable to respond to changing circumstances, especially the encroachment of the rest of the world in the mid-19th century. All those Europeans looking for silk and spice, that's what it was about. Uh, so the modern world was knocking on Japan's door in the isolated country the shoguns had created and maintained for nearly three centuries, was unable to withstand the pressure. Uh, so al although devastated after the Imjin War, you know, Korea survived and align itself with China. I should say realign. You know, China has long been a dominant influence on Korea, much more than Japan ever was. Korea modeled itself after China, uh, bringing Confucianism in as the state religion, just like China. Uh, and you have the you have the Choson Dynasty. So who are they? According to your book, the Choson Dynasty. It's also spelled uh, with a J. So it's Choson and Joson. It's not Joson and Joson, like, like a like a light J. Joson, Choson. Uh, who were they? Uh, they were the last and longest lived imperial dynasty. 1392-1910. It's a long time, 500 more plus years of Korea. According to your book, the Choson dynasty ruled Korea from the fall of the, of the Koryo 
Kingdom to the Colonization of Korea by Japan. So 510 years, uh, again, more than twice as long as the United States has been, as we speak anyway. But segregated, discriminatory, so based on who you were or where you came from, your family lineage. To obtain any, any type of civil work or government work, one had to belong to a certain class called the Yangban. So it's not Yangban, it's not Yangban, it's young, uh, Yangban. Okay? So who were the Yangban? They were part of the traditional ruling class or gentry of dynastic Korea during the Choson dynasty. Uh, okay, let's watch a film regarding the Yangban and who they were. Uh, so I apologize for the end of this film. Professor Oh is the narrator of this film. She's a typical YouTuber with lots of ads and chatter at the end. Join this, like this, check this out, etc. Uh, this this really is meant to be humorous, and perhaps it is. I don't know if it's entirely uh, successful in that, but but the information is good. So stay with it, please. It isn't too long. Please watch the film entitled Youngbun, uh, Korea's Ruling Elite, and then come on back. Okay, so the so the Youngbun refers to members of the two orders of civil or military officialdom. Uh, whether whether a youngbun's post was civil or military, uh, the former was considered more prestigious than the latter. Uh, so you know, uh, so a, a youngbun essentially was a literati. So what's a literati? We've heard this word in our modern era. They are well-educated people who are interested in literature. Uh, the youngbun was expected to hold public office. Follow the Confucian doctrine through study and self-cultivation, and help cultivate the moral standards of Choson society. Uh, as an elite class, the Youngbun enjoy many privileges, and they actively sought to preserve the purity and exclusivity of their group. Uh, for instance, through marriage, uh, only among members of the Youngbun class. Uh, so the Youngbun had most of the official positions in national and local governments, leaving very little opportunity for anyone else. Uh, okay, to wrap up this, this section here, let's watch another film uh, about the fall of the Choson, uh, whichever way you want to spell it. So this, this film goes into more detail than your book. It goes a little bit past our time frame, our era. But again, I'm always trying to give context, you know, on, on how the, the overall influence of a of an empire or a dynasty, uh, you know, throughout history, so you get a feel for it, even though we're not studying the, the ancient part. So go ahead and watch the film um, entitled The Decline of Joseon Korea, and then come on back. All right, our next section is from Ming to Qing. How did China deal with military and political challenges both inside and outside its borders? So we're talking about the, the original Ming dynasty here, 1368, 1644, nearly 300 years, a long successful dynasty. So who were they? Uh, officially called the Great Ming, they were the ruling dynasty of China from 1368 to 1644 following the collapse of the Mongol-led Yuan dynasty. The Ming dynasty was the last imperial dynasty of China, ruled by the Han Chinese. Uh, so we talk a lot about dynasties and empires. What's the difference? A, a dynasty is ruled by a series of rulers from the same family. An empire is ruled by an emperor or empress. Okay. Uh, so interesting, the, the Ming are known for their vases or vases today. So however you want to say it, vases, vases, tomato, tomato, potato, potato, whatever you say. Um, if, you, uh, if, if you have an a authentic Ming vase today, uh, it's worth some serious money. Uh, okay, so, so part of this is, is a review from, from the earlier in this chapter. So again, the Qing Empire, empire established in China by Manchus overthrew the Ming Empire, 1644. At various times, the Qing also controlled Manchuria, Turkestan, uh, Turkestan, uh, again, different pronunciations, Tibet. The last Qing emperor was overthrown in 1911. Uh, one more time, just so we 
refresh our memory, who were the, who were the Manchus? They were a federation of Northeastern Asian peoples who founded the Qing Empire. <clears throat> okay, so looking at the at the map here, this is this is most of present day China that you see, and you, and you see, of course, they they've also got uh, Mongolia, Manchuria, like like the other slides said, Tibet is all under their influence, Hong Kong. But here you see the, the, the Great Wall also, okay? So most of what, what today is, is modern, modern China is what we're talking about, the Qing Empire, all the present day China. Uh, okay, so you have, so you have a, a transition from the Ming to Qing, known as the Ming-Qing transition, also known as the Manchu invasion of China from 1618 to 1683. Uh, this saw the shift of these two major dynasties in Chinese history, Ming to Qing. Uh, it was the decades-long conflict before the emergent Qing dynasty and the incumbent Ming dynasty. Um, let's look at a film here. Uh, please watch the film entitled The Downfall of the Superpower of China, Ming and Qing Dynasty, and then come on back. Okay, as your book says... After 1500, the, the Ming began to experience changes, and, and they began to have financial, environmental, and administrative issues. This greatly weakened them, and this happens, like I said before, a, 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 a dynasty uh, spreads out, it gets too thin, it's hard to manage people so far away, and they turn against you. So the Ming fell to the Manch Manchus and start the Qing Empire. And, and a period of prosperity ensued here, especially in the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, under the emperor Kangxi, or Kangxi, uh, personal name was Chuan Wei, uh, Chuan Wei, okay? So, so Kangxi, Kangxi means peaceful harmony. So he was the third emperor of the Qing dynasty, uh, second Qing emperor to rule over China proper. Uh, Kangxi's uh, emperor's reign of 61 years from 1661 to 1772 makes him the longest reigning emperor in Chinese history. Uh, upon his father's sudden death from smallpox at the age of 23, uh, Ch uh, Chuan Ye was immediately raised to the imperial throne over his five brothers who had been born to mothers lower in birth than, than him. Uh, so again, it's all about status. Um, because the new emperor was not yet quite seven years old, um, his government was first administered by, again, four regents. So, so Chuan, Chuan Ye began attending to affairs at the start of the age of 13. Uh, he ruled only in name, however. The real power was still firmly in the hand of his four regents, four advisors. Uh, one of them became a virtual dictator, uh, but the people that threatened Kangxi's reign were eliminated by him. Uh, who, so, of course, he did this when he was very young. He, he had to have enlisted help. But with this coup, the 15, by now, 15-year-old emperor proved to the public that he was worthy of that position and was the emperor. Uh, okay, so... Uh, Chen Long ascends to the throne in 1735. He also spent 60 years ruling China, another very long run like Kangxi. Chen uh, Long was not a dynamic ruler. In fact, his later reign was characterized by his own disinterest in ruling, and very unusual for that era. You know, power was greatly pursued and by, by men of power. And more times than not abused, but but Sean Long was more preoccupied with artistic pursuits. He published over forty three thousand poems in his life. Imagine that that's an average of one point three poems for every day day, not year, day of his life. Uh, though he wasn't considered very talented, although he thought he was. At the age of nearly ninety, I have created as many poems as that of the poets of the whole Tang dynasty. Isn't that a legend in the literary world? Uh, and he added his poetry by hand to hundreds of pieces of historical art in the palace. Uh, 
So he was also obsessed with preserving Manchu culture, enacted dictionary and genealogy projects to that end. He also believed that sorcerers were targeting Manchurians, so he created a system of torture to combat that. He also created a program in which thousands of Chinese books that, he, that, that, that had even the slightest disparagement of Manchurians were destroyed. Another reason for doing this in his mind anyway was that it would make history begin with him. <coughs> Excuse me. So he thinks, if I get rid of all the other history before, it'll start with me. Uh, and this is something that we see in history. You know, one people tries to destroy the intellect of another. Very famously, 1933, less than 100 years ago, prior to World War I, May 10th, 1933, university students in Germany burned over 25,000 books that were un-German as a show of support for the Nazi government. This was considered to be a cultural cleansing through fire. Okay, back to our Qing. Uh, so Chinese society and culture became more conservative during the Qing reign, with worsened penalties for homosexuals. Men increased demand for purity in, purity in women, and virgins were sought by men. This led to a mass refusal of men to accept widows as their brides because they're not virgins. This led to a significant growth in the suicides of widows and the creation of homes for widows with interaction with, with men uh, being, being limited. Um, so how were women treated in the Qing dynasty? A, a position of honor for a young woman would be to become a wife of the emperor. So I don't mean just a wife, one of many, many wives. So they were polygamists. They, the emperor had many wives. Uh, it, it could be dozens. And a harem was built, a, a, you know, its own distinct building that housed all the emperor's wives. Uh, their they, their prepubescent male children were allowed to be there, and their unmarried daughters also housed female domestic servants and other unmarried female relatives. So why prepubescent male children? Um, well, you know, once they came of age, you didn't want to have them in there and possibly you know, um, having relations with the woman in there. They wanted to keep it pure, and they wanted that just for the emperor. So uh, some of the guards, uh, I should say all of the guards, were men, but they were castrated first, so they could not pass on their, their you know, um, they could not have children. Um, so they're, they're, these are called eunuchs, and the, the eunuchs were the guards at the harem. They were allowed inside because they couldn't possibly father a child. Uh, another group of women that were also, there were concubines. These are enslaved women, but also housed in the harem. Uh, so, so a concubine is a woman who lives with a man, but has lower status than his wife or wives. <clears throat> so interesting kind of idea. Let's watch the film entitled The Qing Dynasty Harem System. Uh, please watch that film and then come on back. Okay, the Sino-Russian border conflict. Sino means Chinese. It's a, it's a Latin term. Uh, we have a series of intermittent skirmishes here. These skirmishes were between the Qing dynasty with the assistance of the Choson dynasty of Korea. Remember, we talked about the Choson. And the Tsardom of Russia and the Cossacks. We also talked about them before. Uh, over disputes over land in the Amur region in which the Russians tried and failed to gain the land of the north of the Amur River, the 10th longest river in the world. So according to your book, what is the importance of the Amur River? The, this river valley was a contested frontier between, the, between northern China and eastern Russia until the settlement arranged in the Treaty of, of Nerchinsk in 1689. So understand, China and Russia are neighbors. They, they, they share a border. So where is the Amur River? It goes right through the center of present-day uh, China. And you see all the, all the different players here. You, you, of course, China, you got Mongolia over here, the, the river itself. you got Russia, as I said, we're, we're, we're neighbors. Um, so it's all about, all about power and territory. And this results in the, in the Treaty of, of Nerchinsk, uh, 1689, which gave all the land to China. All right, that is the end of chapter eight, uh, 19, sorry. Uh, thank you very much.